Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, today we have Ryan Keenan from University of Arizona. We'll be talking about tools for measuring the cosmic history of molecular gas. Ryan, uh, all yours. Uh, thanks, Junhan. Um, so uh, I, I'm Ryan Keenan. I'm a six year graduate student at Arizona. Um, if you enjoy this talk and have any sway over postdoc hiring at, at Caltech, uh, feel free to put in a good word for me. Um, I'll be on the job market this year. Um, you know, if on the other hand, you don't enjoy this talk, please don't say anything. Um, so I'm gonna talk for a little while about the work I've been doing with my advisor, Dan Maroney and Cardo Keating uh, over at uh, CFA on understanding the, the cosmic history of molecular gas. Um, so as a, as a, to set the table kind of, um, I imagine many of you have seen a plot that looks like this before. Um, if we look back in time and measure the, the integrated amount of star formation in the universe uh, at, a, at, at a variety of redshifts, what we find is that there's, uh, a, a gradual rise until around redshift two, uh, followed by a decline by about a factor of 10 uh, from 10 billion years ago at redshift two until the, the, the present day. Um, so the, the way we, we make this plot is at any given redshift, uh, we, we look for a, a star formation rate tracer. So that could be the infrared luminosity, the UV luminosity, the, the H alpha luminosity, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are many ways to do this, but you, you count up all of the luminosity in one of those tracers that you can see, you integrate it over the, the whole volume of, of, of the universe or over the whole volume of your survey. Uh, and, and then that, that puts a, a point on this plot in, in star formation rate. So the, the question is, uh, why do we see the, the trend that we see in this, in, in this, uh, in this plot? And the answer to that has to, at some at some level, uh, lie in the material that is forming those stars. So we know from the local universe that there's a tight correlation over many orders of magnitude uh, between the amount of cold neutral gas in a galaxy's interstellar medium and the rate at which it's able to form stars. Uh, that correlation extends to high redshifts, um, and it has now been measured. You know. Uh, extensively uh, at, at both uh, resolved scales in the local universe and at galaxy integrated scales up to redshifts uh, of at least two or three. Uh, and so that, that suggests that whatever is going on in the star formation history uh, has to have something to do with, with the molecular gas. Now you can see in this plot on the right, there's quite a bit of scatter in, in, in the correlation between star formation rate and molecular gas. And so uh, it kind of leaves open two possibilities. Um, the, if, if, I, if I take the, the plot of star formation rate versus uh, time that I showed before uh, and draw a second axis on here, that is the integrated amount of molecular gas in the universe uh, at the same period of time, um, the first of, of, of the possibilities that, that, that is uh, open is that the amount of molecular gas in the universe, uh, the amount of star forming material has stayed relatively constant over, uh, over the, the whole history of the universe. And what that would suggest is that galaxies at early times and at late times uh, are just less efficient at converting gas into stars than galaxies at, at the peak of star formation at redshift two. Uh, so what, what that would indicate is that the, this scatter here is actually uh, hiding some real differences in, in, the, ampli or in the, the normalization of this scaling law that, that, that varies with redshift or with, with galaxy type um, that, that conspire to, to, to hide that there's actually a, a relatively uh, minimal changes in the amount of fuel available for forming stars. But the other possibility uh, is that the molecular gas history looks quite similar to the star formation rate history. Uh, and the explanation for the changing star formation rates is that there is simply uh, less gas available to form stars, uh, less gas that's condensed onto galaxies and cooled to the state where 
you know, you can, you can collapse it into stars uh, at high and low redshifts. And so it becomes interesting to go out and try and measure this, this history of molecular gas. So uh, the, the question is how to do that. Um, and for a long time, the go-to tracer of cold molecular gas in galaxies has been carbon monoxide, um, which is the second most abundant molecule in the universe. And we use that instead of the, the most abundant molecule, uh, H2. Uh, because it's easier to, because it produces uh, spectral lines uh, that are easily excited in the conditions that are typical of the, the clouds where molecular gas resides, uh, whereas H2 does not. So if, uh, if I could see the whole universe and what it looked like in, in CO emission, it might be something like this, um, where here I've taken the illustrious TNG simulation uh, and painted on top of each of each of the galaxies in that simulation, uh, a CO luminosity, making uh, some some assumptions about the connection between CO luminosity and uh, galaxy properties in the simulation. Um, so there are a couple of things that show up uh, in, in in this plot. Uh, first of all, the brightness of each galaxy in CO. Uh, is roughly proportional to the amount of molecular gas in that galaxy, uh, modulo some conversion factor, uh, which is known to vary with galaxy properties, uh, but is uh, roughly uh, approximately constant over the range of, of uh, galaxy types that we're able to detect at, at high redshift currently. Uh, but the second piece of information that you can clearly see when you look at this image uh, and one that I'll come back to in a little while, uh, is that there is a lot of structure here that is not uh, just a function of individual galaxies, but instead the, the CO emission traces the large scale structure of the universe. And you can see uh, all of this cosmic web of, of bubbles and or, uh, voids and, and, and clusters. Uh, and that information is also important and very useful. Uh, and and I'll, I'll return to it in a, in a little while. So ideally, we could see uh, the universe that, that looks uh, something like this. And measuring the history of molecular gas would be a, a simple matter of just counting up all of this carbon monoxide. Um, but of course, in, in practice, we're limited by the, the instruments that we have and the, the surveys that we're able to conduct. And so if I take this and uh, instead, instead of showing everything that might be here, uh, show what some realistic galaxy surveys might be able to might might actually detect. Uh, the the picture becomes a little bit more challenging. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, show um, a couple of different galaxy surveys um, or, or approximations of a couple of different galaxy surveys that have actually been conducted over the past couple of years. Um, and so uh, the the survey name is shown at the top here. Uh, I've I've clipped the galaxies to only show things which actually cross the detection threshold of, of the survey I'm showing. Um, and then in the bottom of each each of these images, uh, uh, there's a square that shows approximately the, the area on the sky uh, covered by the survey. And, and then uh, the way that these surveys achieve a large volume is actually by surveying uh, a large range of redshifts. And so if you multiply this area by, uh, you know, all of these area, all of these arrows, which kind of give a sense of the depth, uh, it, it gives you the, the whole volume of the survey. Um, and actually it works out such that the, the way, the, the way this uh, simulation is constructed, the, the area of one of these slices on my screen approximately corresponds to the, the number of galaxies that will show up in one of them approximately corresponds to the actual number that you might see in the survey. So this cold Z survey, which was conducted with a very large array, uh, might detect approximately one galaxy at, at redshift two. This, this simulation is at redshift two. Um, cold Z has a second layer, which did a deeper field. Um, and in a smaller area, that galaxy was able to detect a, a few more objects. Uh, and then the state of the art right now uh, is, is uh, done with ALMA, the Aspects Large Program, um, surveyed uh, both redshift or surveyed redshifts one, two, and three in, in three different CO lines. Uh, and for each of those lines, it can detect a handful of galaxies. 
Uh, the actual number of get objects detected by each of these surveys uh, is uh, four for, for cold C and, and at redshift two aspects was able to detect five. Uh, so the simulation I'm showing here is actually just a little bit optimistic on the number of galaxies that might show up. Uh, but you know, the, the, the key point here is that when you apply the, the realistic sensitivity of these instruments, uh, a, a lot of information is being lost and only with aspects you begin to maybe be able to pick out sort of some of the large scale structure information, uh, at, at least from what can be directly detected. And so this presents a real challenge for measuring the, the history of molecular gas, because if you're only detecting one or three or five objects uh, in, in your entire survey, uh, you're going to be uh, hampered by, by sample variance and by, by cosmic variance because the, the volume of these surveys remains fairly small. Um, and so in order to sort of understand the implications of, of some of these challenges, um, uh, I, I worked on a project uh, using simulations much like the ones I've just shown to sort of quantify um, how, much, how much variance there might be in our measurements. So uh, if I return to this aspect simulation, uh, aspects like simulation, count up all the molecular gas and convert that to a measurement of, of the molecular gas density at, at redshift two to three, uh, I, can, I can put a point on, on this plot I was showing before. Uh, and aspects, as I mentioned before, is nice. It measures uh, a few different redshifts using different CO lines. Um, and, and so in a, single, in a single survey, you're able to get points at a couple of different redshifts. Um, and for one simulation, uh, this, is, this is the resulting molecular gas history that is measured. So uh, this particular realization, I've, I've, this particular uh, mock of the aspect survey suggests uh, that, that the cosmic molecular gas density is relatively flat over time, consistent with that first explanation I gave that the availability of gas isn't changing. It's just the star formation. It's just the efficiency of galaxies at forming stars. Uh, the problem is if I were to run the exact same mock observation on just a, a different uh, chunk of my simulation cube, uh, I'd get a different answer. So uh, doing this a few times, uh, and, and these aren't really cherry picked to, to make a point. These are just the first few realizations of my simulation. Uh, you know, the, the, if, I, if I redraw my, my galaxies, I end up with a, uh, with a history that looks much more like there's a, a, a rise and a peak. Uh, if I do it again, I get another history that looks consistent with a rising star formation rate. And then a, a third time I get something that looks a little bit nonsensical. Um, and if I draw the, the underlying model uh, for the molecular gas history that I put into these simulations, uh, it, it is actually one that, that evolves with time rather than the initial uh, measurement that I showed that per portrayed a, a constant star for uh, molecular gas density, um, which, which is meant to emphasize that uh, the, the state of the art uh, as far as making this measurement is uh, while, you know, making uh, really, uh, uh, while they're making really difficult and really sophisticated measurements uh, with, with ALMA and other I instruments, uh, we're, we remain in a regime where we're very limited by um, our ability to survey large volumes and uh, generate large enough samples. So here uh, I, I've plotted the, the total variance in the molecular gas density uh, for a handful of representative redshifts comparable to what Aspects was able to study uh, as a function of the survey volume. And uh, what we find is that you need to go to about a factor of 10 larger survey than what we're able to do with, uh, with ALMA right now in order to really begin to differentiate the, the redshift spins in terms of their molecular gas density uh, at high confidence. So uh, in, in, in this paper, Keen and et al. Uh, in 2020, we, we studied this and uh, provided some prescriptions for uh, developing future surveys. In particular, we, we provide a, a, a parameterization of the, the variance in, in surveys in, in uh, molecular gas density uh, as a function of, of survey parameters. 
Um, and, and hopefully this will be a useful tool for people contemplating how to, to design future surveys. Um, one particular thing that, uh, you know, we, one, one particular thing we're able to point out with this is that if I take that variance cone that I showed um, for just one redshift range and, and break it up into the variance contribution of uh, Poisson variance, so just the, the, sam the, the, the counting statistics uh, in this lighter gray, and then the, the total variance, which also includes variance due to, to differences between fields, uh, what we find is that as we go to larger and larger surveys, uh, we become dominated, we, we become, the limiting uncertainties become uh, variance, cosmic variance between uh, different fields that we can observe, um, which has implications for how you want to design your survey. So if, if it's possible to minimize cosmic variance, uh, the, the survey volume that you need to need in order to achieve tight constraints on the evolution of molecular gas, uh, shrinks considerably once you get to to surveys that are on the scale of uh, 10 square arc minutes on the sky, uh, uh, or sorry, 100 square arc minutes on the sky. Um, but in order to do that, you have to you have to be careful about designing your survey and have to do things like prioritize, uh, including multiple fields or using a, a survey geometry that 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 samples both uh, over and under densities by perhaps taking a, a long aspect ratio uh, rather than just a, a square field. Uh, but, but the key takeaway here is that in order to really produce uh, tight and detailed constraints on the history of molecular gas, uh, we're going to need much larger surveys. And so the question uh, of is how do we get there, uh, especially when, you know, what the, the the, the thing that I'm showing or the, the, the surveys that we have now are large programs with ALMA and the very large array, um, which means, you know, we're, we're pushing the limits of the instrumentation that, that, that exists right now. And so uh, one possible solution to this is an approach known as line intensity mapping, um, which as uh, both uh, time and COMAP are, are being developed at Caltech, I imagine that that many of you are, are quite familiar with this. But uh, just to just to give a, a quick overview of what it is, um, the the line intensity mapping approach to to surveys uses all this information about large scale structure to to extract more information from from a survey than could be done uh, by attempting to directly measure individual galaxies. So. What, what a line intensity mapping survey might actually see is a field like this. You've got a, a handful of bright objects that, that, that can be detected directly, but mostly uh, you're, looking at, you're looking at a noisy map. Uh, but instead of only, only studying these one or two or three objects that can be individually picked up uh, above the signal to noise ratio, uh, line intensity mapping says, Underneath all of this noise, there there is structure that's being caused by by the by these large scale uh, fluctuations in in the amount of light that's coming from different parts of of the cosmic web, uh, and that structure is going to produce noise in our map that exceeds what we would expect from white noise alone. And so, if you take if if you take the map uh, and measure the power spectrum of it. So what, what this is showing is as a function of scale with large scales being on the left and small scales being on the right, uh, the amount of power or the amount of fluctuations in the map. Uh, what you will expect is that at large scales, there are excess correlations over what you would expect from white noise uh, that are caused by large scale structure. Um, so this is just a schematic representation of what the, the uh, power spectrum of a noisy map of the universe in carbon monoxide emission might look like. Um, and the spectrum broadly has two terms. So uh, on the left here is what we call the clustering term. Uh, you can see here sort of the, the wiggles from baryon, ac baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, and this, this part of the, the power spectrum is proportional to the dark matter power spectrum uh, multiplied by a bias term and the integrated luminosity of all of the CO emitters in, in our in our map. Uh, so 
the, the important thing here for measuring the history of molecular gas is if we think we have a, a general understanding of what the power spectrum of dark matter is doing, uh, we can use the clustering term of the power spectrum to measure the integrated luminosity uh, uh, of all of our galaxies in CO. And that is directly proportional to the uh, total molecular gas abundance of the, of, of the universe at whatever redshift we're looking at. Uh, at smaller scales, there's a second component, which is the shot noise term. Uh, that's caused uh, by the correlation of, of uh, galaxies with themselves. Um, and it contains additional information about the CO luminosity function. Uh, it's proportional to the integral of the, 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 it's proportional to the second moment of the CO luminosity function, uh, which means that even if we can only measure the small scale part of the power spectrum, we can extract some information about uh, what the, the molecular, mo molecular gas is doing, uh, but our, its interpretation is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more model dependent. Uh, so uh, Cardo Keating at, at CFA has been working on measuring this uh, for, for many years now, and it has led uh, the COPS and MIME surveys, uh, which produced some of the very first uh, intensity mapping constraints on the, the power spectrum of CO emission at high redshift. Um, and, and these surveys were designed to use existing instruments. Uh, in particular, they used uh, the Atacama Compact Array and the Karma Array uh, to survey uh, CEO in, in relatively small volumes in order to provide sort of a proof of concept for these analyses. Uh, so in 2016, Cardo published uh, uh, constraints from, from his Karma data on the power spectrum of CO at redshift uh, two to three. Uh, this provided a very tentative first detection of the CO power spectrum. Uh, and then with deeper uh, data from ALMA and the ACA uh, in 2020, he was able to make uh, the, the first secure detection of the power spectrum of carbon monoxide um, at, at uh, sort of redshifts one to five. Um, so this is that power spectrum. Uh, here, we're looking very far into the shot power regime where we don't expect that clustering is going to contribute much of much if any power. So, so here we're dominated by the, the shot power term, which means it's more complicated to extract information uh, about the the large uh, about the uh, the overall gas density. Um, but using some using some simplifying modeling assumptions, it, it is possible to do. Um, and so, if I take uh, all of the measurements that have been made to date uh, using the direct detection approach. So what I was describing before, where you stare for a long time with a really powerful telescope uh, and, and count up all the emission you can see, these are the constraints that they provide on the molecular gas density. Uh, and then if you overplot uh, the constraints from intensity mapping surveys that have been conducted to date, and I'm including the, the COMAP survey as well as COPS and, uh, and, and the MIME survey, uh, you can see that they broadly trace out sort of a, a, a similar pattern where you get this indication that there's a, an evolution in the gas density over time. Um, but there's also some, so, some significant scatter in, in those relations. Uh, so if I just draw a rescaling of the, the star formation rate density that I plotted at the beginning, um, all of this data is is roughly consistent with the with the the changing star formation rate density that that was measured um, that, that that's been measured over the course of of many years in uh, optical and infrared, um, which suggests that uh, sort of the the expected behavior of of molecular gas the star formation density changing or star formation rate changing as molecular gas availability changes. Um, but all, all the same, uh, the error bars in these points are, are large. We see that there is some tension where the, the intensity mapping constraints uh, tend to lie a little bit above the direct detection constraints. Uh, and, and so there's still quite a bit of work to be done here. <clears throat> so Recently, I've been working on uh, validating intensity mapping data uh, using the technique known as cross-correlation, uh, which is uh, 
a, a means to improve the sensitivity of intensity uh, of intensity mapping measurements um, and, and, and verify results. So uh, what I showed earlier when I was introducing uh, intensity mapping was this uh, very pleasant field of white noise and some galaxies. Uh, anyone who's spent a, a lot of time observing, as, uh, especially with an intensity mapping instrument, knows that that is a, a really optimistic picture of what you're likely to get. And in fact, uh, there can be all sorts of systematics and issues in your data. Uh, and so instead, you, you may well end up with something that looks like this, where uh, you know the, the map that you're able to make has things that are clearly not astrophysical, but, uh, but have uh, structure on large scales that will, if not correctly accounted for, uh, contaminate your ability to measure the power spectrum. Um, so here I'm showing a, a real map uh, of data from the COPS survey, uh, where in the, the pilot observations, uh, there was ground, ground pickup that wasn't correctly uh, accounted for and couldn't be, uh, couldn't be easily removed, which created, produced this ridging structure uh, across the map. Uh, and if I just make the power spectrum of, of this data, uh, you find an enormous excess of power at, at small scale or at large scales, uh, which, you know, I, the, the thing we're trying to detect ideally is the clustering of galaxies at, at, at these large scales. Uh, and so this, this power excess uh, can kind of masquerade as the signal we're trying to look for and it, uh, makes the point that if we're not very careful uh, when analyzing intensity mapping data, uh, we can be sort of tricked by these systematics into thinking we've detected something when there's really nothing there. Uh, so with the original COPS analysis, trying to remove, uh, trying in, in order to try and remove this systematic, um, a lot of things were tried. Uh, one of which was just clipping out the the high significance modes in in the um, in in the in the data, um, but you know no amount of cleaning that can be applied to this data can really fully remove that excess power. So uh, here I'm showing uh, removing uh, removing modes with obvious contamination down to different levels, and no matter how many you remove. Uh, there's still an excess here uh, compared to the actual power spectrum that was measured, uh, which shows uh, no excess power above above the uh, the the sensitivity threshold at 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 large at small k. Um, so in the final COPS analysis, most of this data ended up getting thrown out. Uh, fortunately, it was from a, a pilot part of the survey, and so uh, uh, later observations were redesigned to correct for this effect. Um, which is why you, you don't see it in this final power spectrum. Uh, but it does result in having to toss out about 500 hours worth of COPS data. Um, so one way to overcome this is if we return to this schematic I've shown here, um, and hopefully on the screen, you can sort of see the, the, the points I've plotted over the top. Um, but, uh, Basically, the, the, the point is that uh, an intensity map or the data we get from intensity mapping uh, is, is not the only information about large scale structure we have in many of these fields. So uh, galaxy surveys, optical galaxy surveys can go out and measure the redshifts of hundreds or even thousands of galaxies uh, in, in uh, a field that overlaps uh, with an intensity mapping field. Uh, and, and the, the white points on, on the right here and the black and white points on the left uh, are, are meant to show the set of galaxies that might be detected in a, in a typical uh, spectroscopic galaxy survey. So that catalog of galaxies contains the same clustering information as the intensity map, uh, but is made using a completely different methodology and therefore contains none of the systematics that are present in the, the noisy uh, intensity mapping data. And so if we can combine these two uh, sets of data, it will make it possible, it might make it possible to, to clean up systematics in the in intensity mapping data uh, without just having to throw out uh, bad, bad data like what I was showing before. 
So in, instead of correlating the intensity map with itself, we cross-correlate the galaxy catalog and the intensity map. Uh, and, and that produces a cross power spectrum, which schematically looks very similar to the, the power spectrum that I was showing before. Uh, you still have a clustering term and a shot term. Uh, the clustering term is still proportional to the, the total luminosity of, of CO um, with a, a, an additional bias term to account for the, the, the um, bias of the galaxy tracer that you've used. Uh, and the shot term is now proportional to uh, the total luminosity of the galaxies in your galaxy catalog. So it, uh, measuring the shot term is, is analogous to stacking all of the galaxies in your catalog uh, and measuring the, the CO luminosity of that stack. Um, one other thing to note is that uh, it is possible for the, the uh, shot power level in a, in a cross correlation to be significantly lower than the shot power level in, in the auto correlation spectrum that you, you measure. Uh, so it's possible that for a survey covering uh, sort of the same volume uh, that you'll have greater sensitivity to this clustering term um, because you're, you're, there's uh, less of the power spectrum that is dominated by the, by the, the shot noise uh, regime, which potentially makes it easier to measure uh, the clustering power and and to directly constrain um, the the integrated CO luminosity of, of your of your map. So the COP survey was explicitly designed to enable uh, cross correlation measurements. Um, all of its or many of its fields were selected to overlap with uh, major major optical uh, and infrared observational efforts. Uh, and particular in particular, one of the fields that COPS observed. Uh, was the Goods North field. So uh, here's an image of, of Goods North where I've highlighted uh, with, with uh, small markers, all of the galaxies at, at, in the redshift range covered by the COPS data. Uh, and then the, the large blue circle is the, the field from, from the COPS survey. Um, and, and so you can see there's a large uh, quantity of, of, of spectroscopic galaxy uh, a large, a large catalog of galaxies that we can cross correlate with. So the the contaminated data I was showing before is for the Goods North field, and if I take that exact same data set and use cross correlation uh, between the the galaxies and the or the the optically selected galaxies and the the COPS uh, intensity map. Uh, the resulting cross spectrum is shown on the right here with the, the contaminated auto spectrum shown on the left for comparison. And you can see that it doesn't matter what sort of cleaning I applied to the data before I do this analysis, the resulting cross power spectrum uh, shows no indication of contamination. So even with no cleaning at all, um, the, the results uh, are, are completely consistent with the, the, the most cleaning that, is, that, that I showed on, on this map, um, which is a really promising indication that cross-correlation is able to successfully eliminate many of these systematics. So here's the final cross spectrum from, from, from the analysis we performed. Uh, unfortunately, the, the one field that we're able to do this analysis on isn't deep enough that we're able to detect the, the cross power spectrum at, at high significance. Um, however, the, the sensitivity threshold that we reach is actually uh, at, at the limit where some of the, some of the optimistic models for what we expect the, the cross power spectrum might look like are sort of just below our, our detection threshold. Um, and, and so uh, in order to uh, sort of extract the maximal information we can from, uh, from this data, uh, we performed a fit to the power spectrum uh, where uh, we, a, a two component fit with a, a shot noise term. So a, a, flat, uh, a, a flat component across all scales uh, plus a clustering term that is a, a scaling factor times uh, the, the uh, a model for the dark matter power spectrum. Uh, so we, we fit these data uh, with such a model, uh, and, and these are the results. Um, you can see here that uh, with just naively doing this fit, uh, we find that the scaling factor for the clustering term is uh, marginally uh, favors positive values. Um, but 
you should note that this is accomplished at, at the expense of favoring very negative uh, shot power values, um, which would imply that the, the galaxies in the catalog have a, a negative CO luminosity, uh, which is not really physical. So uh, doing this fit alone, uh, while it, it, it suggests that there's power, uh, clustering power in the map, uh, it, it, the, these results aren't, aren't really reliable. Um, but we can't, what we can do is say that the shot component of the power spectrum uh, is proportional, er, uh, as, I, as I showed before, it's related to the total luminosity of the galaxies in the catalog. Um, and we have constraints on what that, that integrated luminosity might be from, from the sort of direct detection type of surveys and stacking results. Um, and so if we use those to establish a prior on what the, the luminosity might be and rerun the fit, uh, it, it forces the shot power to be positive, which uh, also pushes the, the clustering power back towards a, a closer to zero value. So uh, we haven't yet detected the, we, we haven't yet been able to detect the, the cross power in, in, um, in, in an intensity mapping data set, uh, at, at least for CO. Um, but we are uh, sort of very close to the threshold where we think that we'll be able to start ruling out models with uh, sort of the next generation of intensity mapping experiments. Um, actually, to, to quantify just how close we are, uh, so this is sort of this gray region highlights uh, what can be excluded uh, by our non detection of, of the power spectrum. Um, and uh, here, I've also ruled out what can be excluded by the direct detections from, from uh, the, the deep surveys like aspects, uh, which place lower limits on what you would expect the, the total integrated luminosity to be. Um, and, and if I could even just use all of the data from COPS, so not just one field, but the, the full survey, which contained approximately 10 times more data than, than what was available in Goods North, uh, I'd be able to rule out some of the most optimistic or detect some of the most optimistic models for what the cross power spectrum would be. Um, so uh, just to, to place these constraints in, in context, uh, currently the, the upper limit we're able to achieve with, with COPS is about a factor of 10 above uh, where we think the, the, the luminosity of the, the integrated luminosity of galaxies would be. Uh, but we're, uh, if I were able to use, you know, all of the data, it, the, the upper limits we'd be able to place would be uh, relatively constraining. And with sort of the next generation of intensity mapping experiments, which are ongoing now, uh, we're going to be able to do a, a lot better. Um, so in, in the near future, um, Caltech is directly involved in both the time and COMAP experiments, uh, which are going to measure uh, CO, it, it performs CO intensity mapping from basically redshift uh, one up to redshift three and uh, potentially even higher, um, and also provide information about higher redshifts via the, the uh, far infrared C2 emission lines. Uh, and, and the forecast of what those might be able to do looks something like this, where uh, over you know smaller redshift intervals, they're going to be able to place much tighter constraints on the molecular gas density uh, than what has been possible so far. Um, so in, in the final few minutes, I'm gonna, gonna change tune uh, and talk quickly about uh, one other project I've been working on, uh, which is understanding the excitation of different CO lines. Uh, so if I return to this figure, uh, one, one thing I haven't talked about so far is that many of these points are, are made by measuring uh, different emission lines. So carbon monoxide has a whole ladder of spectral lines, uh, but the conditions under which those lines are excited uh, differ, uh, which means that trying to compare uh, directly uh, a measurement made in, in one carbon monoxide line and a different one uh, can be uh, tricky. Um, so to, to highlight the how this impacts um, the, the measurements I've been talking about, um, I'll, I'll just quickly run through which sets of uh, observations on this plot are done in which lines. So 
Uh, CO1 to zero is sort of the, the traditional line that's been used to measure molecular gas, and it is easily excited in all conditions where you might expect to find molecular gas. Um, and it's been used for a handful of these studies, uh, but then many of them rely on CO2 to one or CO3 to two, um, and, and a handful of, of studies even use higher, um, higher energy transitions. And as you go from CO1 to zero to, to progressively higher uh, CO transitions, the conditions under which they become excited become uh, much more stringent, uh, meaning that these lines might not be as uh, reliable for tracing the total amount of molecular gas. Trying to understand the excitation of those lines at, at high redshifts uh, requires, uh, you know, measuring multiple lines from a single object, uh, which can be extremely time consuming. Um, so the the sort of go to um, measurement of this uh, it has uh, been this Dottie 2015 paper, uh, which looked at uh, three star forming galaxies at around redshift one um, and, and constrained the, the ratios of the different CO lines. Um, but the, the galaxies that they're able to detect are very massive things. Uh, so things with uh, nearly 10 to the 11th stellar mass or solar masses of, of, of stellar mass. Uh, which you know at, at very high redshifts, those are those are uh, large objects and not really representative of the overall galaxy population. And so, if we want to interpret what's going on with uh, lower mass galaxies, uh, we we need uh, uh, we, we may need different constraints. Um, so, over the past couple of years, I've been using the Arizona Radio Observatory's submillimeter telescope in Mount Graham to go and measure the excitation of different CO lines, uh, in particular, the CO2 to one and CO3 to two lines uh, relative to CO1 to zero in a handful of local galaxies, uh, or actually a large number of local galaxies, uh, with the idea being to identify trends uh, between galaxy properties and CO line excitation uh, that will be relevant for interpreting high redshift studies where we can't make these measurements directly, uh, at least in large samples. Uh, so here is the, the sample that's been covered by, by this study. Um, it, it ranges in stellar mass from uh, 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 11th. And in star formation rate, it, it covers an enormous range uh, with detections down to star formation rates of roughly uh, 0.1 solar mass per year uh, up, to, up to starburst galaxies. And looking at the excitation of, of the CO lines, this is what we find. Uh, so here I'm showing only things that have been observed in both CO2 to 1 and CO3 to 2, um, which, is a, which is a small fraction of our sample. Um, but you see that there are clear trends between the excitation of the, of the, the higher energy CO lines uh, and things like the star formation rate of the galaxies, uh, which indicate that when interpreting um, detections of CO2 to 1 or CO3 to 2 at high redshift, uh, we have to carefully consider the, the galaxies in our sample. Um, this trend is even more apparent if I include all of the galaxies for which I have uh, CO2 to 1 and CO1 to 0 measurements only. Uh, so here there's a, a strong trend with uh, the, the lowest star formation rate galaxies showing the lowest excitation and the, the highest star formation rate galaxies showing much higher excitation. Um, and so this will have implications for, for how we interpret uh, detections of, of high, high JCO um, at high redshift, particularly as, as surveys uh, begin to push to uh, fainter and fainter objects. And for uh, intensity mapping studies where we uh, are able to use the, the power spectrum to extract information about uh, all objects, including the faint ones, um, comparing intensity mapping observations done in different lines is going to require sort of careful uh, thought about the distribution of galaxies in that, that's going into that, that integrated number uh, in terms of, of these excitation properties. Um, so I will wrap up there. Um, here, here's just kind of a summary of the, the, the tools that I've de described. Um, the you know the 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 key take home hopefully is that uh, you know the 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 measurement of the molecular gas density over over cosmic time is 
uh, sort of an exciting area of, of, of open research in submillimeter astronomy. Um, and we're in the process of developing a, a number of tools that are going to let us do uh, a much better job of making this measurement in the not, not too distant future uh, and, and do some really cool things. Um, so thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Uh, is there any questions? Yeah. Um, um, oh, I have a yeah, basic sorry. question. Uh, the, can you hear me? Uh, I, I, I think I can hear you. I'm not sure how well. Uh, oh. Could you go back a few slides? I guess the the oh it didn't okay. Uh, I guess yeah oh, yeah here. Uh, what are the controls on the plot on the right? Oh so yeah sorry. Um, the the contours uh, are the distribution of galaxies in uh, stellar mass and star formation rate from SDSS. Um, they are uh normalized as a function of stellar mass so they 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 just show you know at uh there there aren't many galaxies with you know uh 10 to the 11.5 uh stellar masses um so i, I i've normalized so it can show their distribution in, in star formation rate uh to emphasize that there's sort of a uh, bimodal distribution of of star formation with uh sort of uh, star forming galaxies lying above uh, quiescent um, elliptical galaxies, basically in the local universe. All right, thanks. Yep. Okay, yeah, there's a question along. Yeah, Andreas, uh, please mute yourself and ask a question. Uh, Andreas, I think you're still muted. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah sorry. Um, so I have two questions. One is probably very short. Um, from your uh, simulations, what do you think is better for survey planning? Um, a contiguous field of, of uh, uh, observations or random point things? Uh, so it's it's hard to give a, a definitive answer, um, and it, it sort of lies in in the analysis method you you want to to use. So uh, for intensity mapping, um, you sort of have to you you have to map a contiguous field uh, in order to get the the large scale um, modes of the power spectrum, which is where most of the information we want uh is located um and, and if you were to just do individual random pointings you you'd be very limited to the the, the shot power uh regime uh, which doesn't sort of uh, misses out on most of the the advantages you can grab from doing an intensity mapping survey uh on the other hand if you're designing a survey uh with direct detection in mind um Random pointings it will significantly reduce the um, it will significantly reduce the amount of field to field variance. Um, so if, if you were to able to combine, say, uh, ten random pointings to to produce the same area as, as for example, the the aspects um, volume, you might be able to push uh, sample variance down by not quite a not not quite a factor of half um but but still significantly uh and, and as you go to larger and larger survey areas that's going to make more of more of a difference uh, and so uh I, I think for direct detection um random pointings is a potentially uh as long as you can find the the ancillary information from from uh, other redshifts that you need uh Pointing across the sky might be very valuable, mm -hmm. uh, and actually the 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 FIB survey, um, which was a targeted survey of of um, individual galaxies at high redshift, uh, 
scattered kind of throughout a, a couple of different fields, um, went back and uh, did a sort of blind search through their data that that sort of accomplishes something like this, um, which I think is kind of a, a clever way to to get more out of um, more out of a targeted high redshift survey as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I, yeah, the, so the second question I had is, is very similar. So the, you mentioned with the cross correlation, you used the MOSTEF uh, redshifts, mm -hmm. spectroscopic redshifts. Um, do you know um, if if you would use photometric redshifts, would that still be good enough? Or what is what is kind of the number of redshifts you need versus the accuracy um, to get a, the best result? Yeah. So. Um... The sort of the the, the best uh, work that I've come across, or the, the most direct answer to this, uh, is a paper by Dong Wu Chung, who uh, looked at used simulations to to directly model um, what happens if you with, with, with different um, redshift accuracy. Um, and, and so the problem with photometric redshifts is that uh, the um, line of sight direction in the line of sight direction. Uh, the photometric metric redshifts are generally not accurate enough um, to to get a, a, a good correlation, and so you you lose um, a, a lot of your signal because the uh, photometric redshifts can just be offset from the the true location of the galaxy. Um, which even e even with uh, spectroscopic redshifts, that that can sort of be the case. So the um, the accuracy of, of spectroscopic redshifts is uh, sort of right around the channel size of the, the COPS data. Uh, and if you had higher resolution um, uh, submillimeter data, a lot of that higher resolution along the, the, um, the spectroscopic axis would be, it, it wouldn't help you because that, that at, at smaller scales, the correlation is just lost. Um, so, if you could use uh, photometric redshifts in a very coarse uh, spectral uh, survey across the, or a very uh, spectrally coarse uh, radio survey across a large volume, um, you might be able to get around some of that. Uh, but I think uh, with sort of the data sets that are available right now, um, you, you need the spectroscopic redshifts in order to, to get uh, a good cross correlation. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, any other last question? Okay, um, yeah, if not, uh, let's thank Ryan again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.